Michael Avenatti, welcome to the show. Um, I have to say when we started this podcast, I did not expect to be talking to the lawyer to one of the president's alleged mistresses about hush money payments and international bribery rackets, but you know, 2018, here we are. <laughs> um, so when you tweeted out information about all the companies and foreign oligarchs who paid Michael Cohen for access to Donald Trump last week, uh, you promised that there'd be more information to come. So my questions are, what additional information do you have? What does it tell us about Cohen and potentially about Trump? And why do you think it's important for all of us to know this information? Well, I'm not at liberty, at least today, to describe all of the evidence and all of the information that we have and that we're continuing to gather. Um, you know, one one of the positive aspects of the media effort that we've undertaken over the last eight weeks, John, is that we are now seen by many as the repository of uh, information and we are seen as a trusted source that people can come to if they have information that uh, they believe should come to light or should be run to ground, investigated, et cetera. And so I think that's been a very positive thing for us because with each passing day, uh, whether it's Monday through Friday or, or Saturday or Sunday, we're acquiring more information uh, for use not only in our case, but also information that I think is important for people to learn about uh, and be disclosed. Uh, you know, as it relates to why I think the information we disclosed last week is important uh, as it relates to Michael Cohen. I, I mean, there's a whole host of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, he was never a registered lobbyist. He was never a registered foreign agent. Uh, there's no question at this point that he was selling access to the president, to the highest office of the land. Uh, we don't know yet whether some of those payments made their way to Donald Trump or one of his organizations. Uh, excuse me, the entire thing does not sound, uh, it, it doesn't pass the smell test. Let's just put it that way. Uh, you hinted that Cohen's payment to your client might have come from a company linked to a Russian oligarch. When you put something like that out there, are you doing it because you have certain information um, that might prove that, that you just haven't released yet? Or are you introducing sort of a new public narrative about the case? What's, what's the purpose behind that? Well, I want to be really clear. We didn't say that the money came from a company that may have ties to a Russian oligarch. We said that the money came from a company, Columbus Nova, um, that does have ties to a Russian oligarch. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, I think that Columbus Nova has provided a number of different narratives or responses in, res in response to what we released, none of which check out. I think Mother Jones did a pretty thorough job, I think, on Friday of debunking a lot of the denials where they're trying to now separate Columbus Nova uh, from the uh, from the uh, uh, overseas entity and from the Russian oligarch, and I don't think anything, any of it really passes any degree of scrutiny. I mean, there's no question that there's significant ties between that entity um, and the Russian oligarch at this point. Uh, so since you released the memo, you've been calling on the Treasury Department to release any suspicious activity reports around Michael Cohen's financial dealings. Um, do you know for a fact that those suspicious activity reports exist? Uh, yes, I do. I know for a fact that there are suspicious activity reports. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reported on at least one of them, I believe, back in February or March. We know for a fact that there's multiple others. Uh, we don't know why the Treasury Department will not release them. I understand that generally they're confidential, but the reason why they're generally confidential is because they don't want to tip off the target as to their existence. Well, in this case, we know that the target's Michael Cohen, and we know um, of their existence because of, among other reasons, the Wall Street Journal reported on it back in February or March. So that's not a valid reason not to uh, release them. And this is a matter of significant public concern. Tens of millions of people uh, have a desire to see this information. And look, if the information that we disclosed is inaccurate, or if uh, Michael Cohen or the president have information that suggests that what we've said is inaccurate, then they should be wholly supportive of this idea of uh, Tr Mr. Trump's Treasury Department releasing the SARS. They should also be wholly supportive of the idea of releasing his bank records. And we're not talking about a lot of bank records. We're talking about 14 or 15 months of bank records on a single bank account for Essential Consultants LLC. Well, there's a reason why they haven't released that information. And it's because not only is it going to confirm what we've already stated, but it's going to get far, far worse for uh, Mr. Cohen and likely Mr. Trump. And that's why this information hasn't been released, John. Are you concerned 
that the uh, Treasury's Inspector General has launched an investigation into how you have come to receive this information? Do you feel confident about how you got the information in the first place? Well, let me say a couple things about that. First of all, um, I have no problem with the investigation. Uh, We did not do anything wrong. We did not do anything illegal. So I'm not at all concerned about that. But what I am a little concerned about is the way the investigation has been reported. Uh, You know, a couple things. First of all, the investigation, uh, there's no confirmation that I'm under any investigation for anything by the Treasury Department or anyone else. So uh, any suggestion to that is completely false. Second of all, uh, there's no suggestion uh, that there's an investigation into the leak of a SAR, per se. Uh, that has not occurred. Uh, what, has, what has been confirmed, I think, by, by Treasury is that they have launched some sort of investigation into something relating to some of this information, and that's about it. So uh, I just think it's important that that be reported accurately, and some of the other news organizations haven't done that. Okay. So let's talk about over the weekend. On Sunday, you tweeted a picture of Michael Cohen, Michael Flynn, and former Qatari diplomat Ahmad al-Rumahi meeting at Trump Tower on December 12th, 2016. Uh, You then asked, why was al-Rumahi meeting with Michael Cohen and Michael Flynn, Flynn, and why did he later brag about bribing administration officials according to a sworn declaration filed in court? Do you know if there have been Qatari payments to Cohen, Flynn, or or other Trump associates? Well, unfortunately, John, I'm not at liberty to, to answer that question, but I stand behind what we uh, what I tweeted out, uh, and I believe the declaration that was filed in court uh, is accurate. And I think all of this raises some very, very serious questions relating to Michael Cohen and exactly what he was doing and his role. I mean, we got to remember that Michael Cohen, to the best of my knowledge, did not have a formal position in connection with the transition, never had a formal position in connection with the administration, never had a security clearance, never registered as a lobbyist, never registered as a foreign agent. So what is he doing meeting uh, these two Qatari gentlemen uh, in the lobby of of Trump Tower and clearly taking them upstairs in the elevator? uh, And then they depart about an hour and a half later. Michael uh, Flynn is there that same day. This seems very suspicious. I mean, they're they're not going up in Trump Tower to to purchase Christmas gifts or to uh, have lunch or dinner. That's clear. How much do you think... Um, knowing what you do, that a lot of this wrongdoing is centered around Cohen, and how much how much do you think Trump knows or knew about what Cohen was doing? I think any suggestion right now um, or in the foreseeable future that uh, Mr. Trump had no idea what Mr. Cohen was doing and Mr. Cohen was just off on his own, doing his own thing, uh, without any supervision or knowledge by Mr. Trump, I think it's it's complete nonsense, John. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a president who has stated unequivocally in the past uh, that uh, you know he likes to know what's going on at all times. He especially has a problem with people making money on him uh, without his pre-approval or knowledge. I mean, we've heard that in many many uh, circumstances. Uh, there's nothing to suggest that him and Mr. Cohen were not in regular communication. In fact, just the opposite is true. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that they did have regular. Uh, communication. I mean, the president did not hesitate in early April on Air Force One to refer the media and the American people to his attorney, uh, Michael Cohen, for answers to questions relating to the reimbursement payments, uh, which we know those statements on Air Force One now were flat out lies. So uh, I think any suggestion that Michael Cohen was off on his own doing his own thing and the president never knew is complete nonsense. And John, you know, I'll tell you, I think, and I've been, I've been really firm in this prediction, and I stand by it today more than ever. There's no question Michael Cohen's going to be indicted. There's no question he's going to flip on the president. And when he does, he's going to lay out, I am confident, in great detail about what Mr. Trump knew, when he knew it, and what he did about it. So you've seen all the same smoke that we have coming out of the Mueller investigation. You've probably seen a lot more with the information that you have. Where do you think the fire is? And What would you be looking into if you were Robert Mueller right now? Well, I don't want to presuppose that or put myself in Robert Mueller's shoes, because I got to tell you, those those are big shoes to fill. And I have a lot of respect for um, for Robert Mueller and and his talents and the talents of his team. I mean, these are some very skilled uh, prosecutors, uh, very talented attorneys, and I'm sure they're doing an incredible job. 
but I, you know, let me tell you this. I, I think that Russian collusion, I think that that's a very difficult thing to prove for a variety of reasons, um, including that a number of the witnesses, the vast majority of the witnesses, are not on U.S. soil and are not subject to subpoena power, which is a real problem when you're an attorney trying to prove a case like that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean it can't be done, but I just think that's a very difficult case to prove. There's, it's a very uh, complicated situation uh, in my view. I think that it's much more likely that ultimately what's going to be proven are, are other crimes like bank fraud, money laundering, um, wire fraud, uh, whether it relates to the $130,000 payment to my client uh, or other business dealings of Michael Cohen. I, I think at the end of the day, that's going to be, or those charges are going to be much easier to prove and also much easier to implicate the president in. That's my belief. Uh, so there's a little story this morning. Um, you threatened to take legal action against the Daily Caller for potential defamation, uh, according to tweets from one of their reporters. I always use that word loosely with Daily Caller. Um, that included screenshots of an email exchange you had with him. Um, do you think their story about you qualifies as defamation? What what was going on with that story? Yeah, let me let me say a couple things. So, you know, not all attorneys are ethical because they're attorneys, and not all reporters or journalists are ethical and comply with journalistic standards because they call themselves journalists or reporters. And you know, your statement, I agree a hundred percent with. I mean, look, I don't have a lot of respect for the Daily Caller. I don't think these are journalists or reporters. Um, I think they're hacks. I think they come to stories with a dedicated purpose, and I think in this instance, everything they've written, they've come to uh, they've come to write uh, for the purpose of taking shots at me and my client, and degrading us and demeaning us, and it, basically engaging in a character assass assassination. So, you know, look, I don't think there's anything wrong with calling out a journalist or a reporter when one believes that they have engaged in improper uh, reporting. Uh, disregarded standard journalistic uh, uh, standards, if you will, and uh, engaged in basically uh, unethical conduct. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, so, and just like I would not, if an attorney was engaged in unethical behavior or conduct, I wouldn't naturally jump to their defense just because they're a member of the bar without knowing the facts. And therefore, I think it's somewhat improper for other journalists to immediately jump to engage in this knee-jerk reaction and jump to the defense of the Daily Caller without looking at the story, without knowing all the facts. Um, so you've obviously uh, been on television a lot over the last few weeks. Uh, you've been arguing a lot of your client's case in public. What is the rationale behind uh, such a media-heavy strategy in this case? Well, this is not your average case. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination, and no, and and you know, and cases you you handle each case a little differently, but but depending on where it's venued, depending on what the issues are, depending on the the public interest, uh, et cetera. And and look, I stand behind our strategy. I think our strategy has worked uh, nearly perfectly. We have uh, we have forced them into making a series of errors, uh, which have only strengthened our case over the last eight weeks. Uh, because we've been so out front, uh, again, we're acquiring additional information that assists our case, uh, that also assists the American people in learning about what really happened here. Uh, you know, I understand they don't like our PR strategy. They'd like nothing more than for us to just, uh, you know, pack up and go home for a while, but we're not going to do that. I mean, what we're doing is working, uh, and it's working really well. Now, that doesn't mean to suggest that it's always going to work that well. Things can change. I mean, this is a very dynamic situation. But right now, I'm very pleased on on the strategy we adopted, and we're going to continue to use it until it breaks. Uh, you were telling people last week, you know, that the, they were sending you info and telling people, like, you know, if they want to help the cause, they should send in info. Um, what is your cause? A at this point, is it bigger than Stormy Daniels' case individually? Is there something else that you're after here? It seems like you know, as you're talking more and more about sort of all the entanglements between Cohen and Trump, it, you know, it, it's beyond, you know, the NDA between Stormy Daniels and um, and Donald Trump here. Our three primary goals, John, remain invalidating the NDA, uh, seeking damages uh, for the defamatory statements of Michael Cohen, seeking damages for the defamatory statements of Donald Trump, and uh, also letting it be known that those 
that my client's statements were in fact true, even though uh, Michael Cohen and Mr. Trump effectively called her a liar on repeated occasions. And then as an ancillary, uh, I guess as an ancillary goal, uh, ensuring that, that the truth and the facts are known to the American people and laying out the evidence for them that may come into our possession. And to the extent that those that, that evidence and those facts lead to um, other repercussions, you know, so be it. Let the chips fall where they may. People that are far more powerful and far smarter than me and my client will ultimately make those decisions. Michael Avenatti, thank you so much. If, uh, if you have more evidence and information to share, you're always f- free to do so here on Pod Save America. Well, happy back anytime. <laughs> thank you, John. Appreciate it very much.